Okay, so hello everyone and welcome to the 2021 edition of the Royal Tyrol Museum Speaker Series. My name is Francois Terry and I'll be your host today. So today the Royal Tyrol Museum and its cooperating society are very happy to present Miss Ashley Reynolds. Ashley is a PhD candidate in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at the University of Toronto in Ontario, Canada. Uh, Ashley was originally scheduled to present a talk last year uh, for the speaker series, but due to the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, unfortunately, we had to, uh, we were forced to uh, cancel our talk. So we're delighted that Ashley uh, graciously accepted our invitation to come back this year to present the results of her research. So Ashley is originally from the city of London in Southern Ontario. She obtained her bachelor's degree at the University of Toronto and decided to stay there to pursue her PhD. For her dissertation, Ashley is studying the growth and ecology of fossil and living cats with a focus on the saber-toothed cat Smilodon fatalis. Ashley's research interests focus on exploring methods for reconstructing the ecological traits of extinct species and studying the ecological factors involved in their extinction. She has conducted fieldwork in the Medicine Hat area of Eastern Alberta, looking for fossils of Ice Age mammals. Today, Ashley will present an overview of her research on the Ice Age mammals from Alberta. So without further delay, it is my great pleasure to present you Miss Ashley Reynolds. So Ashley, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction. And um, thank you everyone for, for coming to listen. It's, it's a shame that I am not able to join you in person, but I'm happy to be here virtually. Well, I'm gonna talk to you today about some of the Ice Age fossil finds uh, from the city of Medicine Hat, Alberta. Um, but first, I want to acknowledge the land on which I live and work. Uh, so I live and work in Toronto. And for thousands of years, the area we now know as Toronto has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Um, it's still a meeting place and home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. And I'm really, really grateful to uh, have the opportunity to live and work on this land um, as a settler. So to get right into it, I do want to first tell you a little bit about how I came to work on things for Medicine Hat. And my entry um, is through this really beautiful predator that you see here it is the saber-toothed cat Smilodon. And Smilodon is, like I mentioned, a cat, but it belongs to a group of cats that are completely separate from all of the living cats we have today. So you call these the saber cats or the saber tooth cats. And there are many different species of saber tooth cats. They're kind of um, this lost lineage of the family of carnivores we call Felidae. And in addition to being related to living cats like a lion or a tiger or a house cat that you maybe have at home, they are also related to other carnivorous species that are alive today like hyenas, uh, civets, uh, meerkats are a really good example. Um, the Smilodon itself has three different species. Uh, I am particularly focusing on one species called Smilodon fatalis. Uh, for the purposes of this talk, I'll probably commonly refer to it as just Smilodon. So just know that if I say Smilodon, I mean this species uh, particularly. And what I'm really interested in finding out as part of my PhD thesis is how Smilodon grew uh, and comparing that sort of growth pattern that it shows with the patterns we see in living cats. Uh, in the end, I hope to answer a few questions that are still sort of up for scientific debate about Smilodon, things like whether it lived in social groups like a lion does today, or whether it was solitary like most of the living cats we see today, and also whether or not it was sexually dimorphic. So in a lot of living cats, we see the males are quite a bit bigger than the females, and some research has suggested that this might have not been the case with Smilodon. So I'm hoping that my research will be able to start to untangle some of these questions that are still ongoing in the scientific 
some of the work that recently came out for my PhD thesis um, was published in January in the journal iScience. And what we found was that Smilodon seems to have an interesting family life. So we looked at um, an assemblage of fossils from Ecuador that preserves three individuals of Smilodon fatalis. And what's really interesting about these three individuals is that it looks like they were a mother with two cubs. The cubs themselves are sort of analogous to human teenagers. So they're actually pretty, pretty far along in their growth period. Um, and it seems like they were still living with their mother. So it seems like they stayed with their parents for quite a long time. And this is something that we see today in living cats like lions. On the other hand, we have evidence that while they were staying with their parents for a long time, the actual time in which it takes them to grow large was pretty rapid. So that's sort of more similar to what we see in something like a tiger. So what we see here is this suggestion that we're seeing a mixture of the ecologies of both a lion and a tiger in in Smilodon fatalis. And, you know, these conclusions we have here are based off of sort of the inferences that we can make from these fossils that are, are sort of like piecing together pieces of a puzzle. Um, we're not really getting direct evidence of the growth. We're, we're piecing together things based on other information, like the size of individuals or other individuals that we have from other assemblages. So the rest of my PhD thesis is kind of looking at if there are other lines of evidence that might support this conclusion that Smilodon had this unique sort of growth style and lifestyle. And the way I do that in uh, a technique called bone histology, it's something that uh, is being more widely adopted by paleontologists. And essentially what bone histology does is uh, it, it looks at the microstructure of bone. So you take a bone, you slice it really thin, and then you look at all of the minute features found within it. And of particular interest are these things called growth marks. So you can see them indicated with the arrows on the right side of my slide. And these are growth marks that are deposited on an approximately annual schedule. So every year thereabouts, a growth mark will be deposited. And because of this, we can actually use these growth marks to estimate both the body mass of an animal throughout its lifetime, as well as, of course, its age. And if you put those together, you get a body mass growth curve, which is essentially just a line that shows you whoop, it goes, it gets really big, really fast at this point, and then it sort of levels off when it reaches adult size. So the way we get these thin sections, you can see a quick overview here, you take uh, a limb bone, in my case, I'm looking at the thigh bone or the femur. Uh, you cut it a couple times, you glue it to a slide, and then you grind it really, really, really thin until under a microscope, it is see-through enough that the light shines through and highlights the features. And then I go through and you can see on the right of this slide, I trace the lines of, um, that are deposited by these growth marks, and I use those to create a growth curve. And what I'm interested when I get these growth curves, and I'll show you one of them in a minute, is, um, is this trend that we see in other mammals that social species might grow slower than some species. So an example of this is in primates, where uh, primates that live in a larger group take a longer time to reach adulthood. And this has, has not been explicitly tested in carnivores in the sense that we don't know if it's bigger group equals longer time to adulthood. But there's some conflicting evidence as to whether carnivores show a similar sort of structure. So part of my thesis is actually looking at living cats and their relatives to see if we actually see this pattern of social species growing slower than solitary species. I don't have the answer to that yet, but I do have some preliminary answers on what Smilodon's growth looked like. So this is a graph that compares um, the growth of, this is a single individual Smilodon. So those are the, the lines that are in red, orange, and green. 
And then the two blue lines, the one on top is a lion and the one on bottom is the tiger. And in the table on the right, you see the maximum daily growth rate. So that's essentially the fastest that these animals grow. And in this case, we see that Smilodon grows relatively slowly. So the maximum daily growth rate is lower than we see in either a lion or a tiger. And the social species that, yeah, that's alive today, the lion grows slower than the tiger. So if Smilodon grows slower, even slower than a social species, we think that that might mean that it's social. Of course, we do still have to test this with uh, the data that I'm collecting for living species, but this is promising that promising information that suggests that we might be able to find something about this uh, in the fossil record, which is really, really, really neat. Now, most of the specimens I'm using for my thesis work that I just described come from the Rancho La Brea tar pits. Uh, these are located in Los Angeles, California. Uh, the tar pits are really great for this because they preserve millions of fossils, um, the majority of which come from two large carnivore species. One is the dire wolf and the other is the saber-toothed cat, Smilodon, uh, which of course is what I'm interested in. And these are species that are usually pretty rare in the fossil record. Usually uh, we find that fossil deposits will have many, many, many herbivores and only a few carnivores, if any at all. So to give you a sense of just how prolific the Rancho La Brea sites are, you see here a photo of a man sorting um, fossil specimens. And there's tons and tons of fossils laid on, out on the tables. And I've squinted a lot at this picture and I'm pretty sure basically everything that you see is from Smilodon. So that's a lot of bones. But what I didn't realize when I started my degree, so when I first started working on Smilodon um, from California and from Ecuador, was that it would turn out that Smilodon actually does have an interesting connection to Canada, my home country. Um, and I discovered this connection because of this bone that you see on your screen right now. Uh, this is, as we'll talk about in a little bit, it's a, it's a hand bone. So it comes from a metacarpal, which is one of the bones um, on the palm of your hand. And this one in particular is analogous to the bone that's sort of on the pinky side of your palm. And this bone comes from the city of Medicine Hat. So I'm sure many of you, of course, are living in Alberta and therefore know where Medicine Hat is. But for anybody who might be joining us from elsewhere and has uh, never seen the beautiful province of Alberta, um, we see here in the middle, uh, the province of Alberta on the west, it's bordered by British Columbia and on the east, it's bordered by Saskatchewan. South, it's bordered by Montana. Medicine Hat is located in the southeast sort of quadrant of Alberta. Uh, it's along the South Saskatchewan River and um, it's very close to the Saskatchewan border. So here is a sort of satellite overview of uh, the city of Medicine Hat surrounding the South Saskatchewan River. And in the late 1960s and early 1970s, uh, Rufus Churcher from the University of Toronto and Archie Stalker from the Geological Survey of Canada conducted a field program in which they looked at the geology and vertebrate paleontology of the Canadian prairies. And one of the areas that they spent a lot of time in was, was right here. Uh, you can see sort of if you follow the snaking path of the river, there are these sort of bumpy ridges on, on the banks. And a lot of those bumpy ridges, ridges um, are essentially badlands territory that preserve fossils of ice, ice age mammals. So when Churcher and Stalker worked here, they collected over a thousand specimens from about a dozen localities in the Medicine Hat area. And those specimens were donated to the Royal Ontario Museum where I work in 2014. So what interests me about the fossils from the Medicine Hat area is that they come from a series of rock layers that encompass the end of the Pleistocene. Uh, so the Pleistocene also being sort of colloquially known as the Ice Age and into the Holocene, which is the time period that we're in now. 
so this is really interesting that it, it covers this time period because we see the loss of a lot of really interesting Ice Age taxa during this time. So um, to give you an idea of what, what sort of species we have, uh, these are um, a number of the identifications of specimens that we have from the various Medicine Hat localities. Most of what we have are identified as mammals. And you can see we have carnivores, uh, we have ungulates, so we have pronghorns, um, bison, camels, uh, we have rabbits, elephants, rodents, and ground sloths, as well as horses. Out of these sort of animals that you see listed here, most of them are things that we might actually find in Alberta today. Uh, but there are a few notable sort of Ice Age exclusive taxa, uh, which are highlighted here in green. And this includes many notable Ice Age herbivores that went extinct at the end of the Pleistocene, such as uh, extinct camels, horses, mammoths, and two different types of ground sloth. But of course, uh, as a, a carnivore researcher and as somebody who's interested in fossil cats, what caught my eye here is the entry that I've highlighted, uh, which is the cats, especially the Smilodon, because that's the, the species that I work on. Um, and this really surprised me because, um, you know, at this point in time, I, I didn't know about the fact that there may have been cases of Smilodon from anywhere in Canada let alone so close to uh, where I had also done field work uh, digging for dinosaurs with my supervisor, uh, David Evans. But I dug into the literature and I did, found, I did find that, you know, there was document of, um, of Smilodon from Benison Hat, but I could only find this documentation in what we call faunal lists. And these are essentially just a laundry list of all the species that have been found in a particular fossil area. Um, and faunal lists can be very valuable because they give you a broad overview of all of the different types of animals that are found in a place or were once found in a place. Um, but the sort of standard that we hope to achieve in paleontology is that every single specimen um, is, is described and illustrated. And the reason for this is that one of the sort of core tenets of science is this concept of falsifiability. So things need to be done in, in such a way that they can be proven wrong. And, you know, it's difficult to prove wrong the occurrence of something if it's just listed as present. You don't know what material that's based off of. Uh, you don't know, um, you know, necessarily who made that determination. Often in the, these cases, it's the author, but you, you don't know that for sure. So by describing these specimens and publishing a careful description of them, images of the specimen, uh, in the future, this means that researchers can always revisit those exact same specimens and you know determine whether you're right or wrong about your identifications. And this is particularly important for cases such as this, where there's only one record of a group of interest in a broader geographic reason, or region. Sorry. So in this particular case, this was the only known record of Smilodon from anywhere in Canada, or only proposed record. So you see here a map of North America, and the sort of dark green shaded at the you know, in the south of North America shows all of the places on the continent that Smilodon had been documented. The red dot, of course, is Medicine Hat. And what you'll notice is that this is very far north from the next most northern locality, which was in Idaho. So this is a pretty large jump in geographic space from where we have documented Smilodon in the past. So because of the fact that the specimen is potentially really important for looking at uh, the biogeography of the species or where it lived on, on Earth, uh, what we decided to do, myself and my co-authors, Kevin Seymour and David Evans, was uh, to re-examine all of the cat fossils that uh, had been identified from Medicine Hat, confirm their identifications, publish full descriptions of them. 
So what I'm going to take you through is our um, our descriptions and essentially our findings for all these cat specimens. So first up, we have a tooth from what was originally identified as a Canada lynx. So this is an upper tooth that's found in the upper jaw. It will look very similar if anybody has a cat at home and you brave their mouth to take a look at their teeth. This is probably going to look pretty similar to your, your own domestic cat's teeth. We found that this specimen was about the same size as Canada lynx that are alive today. Uh, but we also know that bobcats, um, which are a close relative of the Canada lynx, were larger during the last ice age, so larger during the Pleistocene than they are today. So this makes it difficult to determine whether this is a lynx or a bobcat because uh, the only thing we really have to go off of is size. Uh, lynx and bobcats have very, very similar looking teeth, uh, at least for, for this tooth, the upper fourth premolar. So what we decided was that uh, we could identify this as belonging to the genus lynx, uh, but we couldn't be specific as to whether or not this was a Canada lynx or a bobcat. Um, so that is the sort of medium sized cat we found, but we also found a number of uh, fossils from big cats. So this one is a metatarsal, that's a bone that comes from the foot. And it was originally identified as an American lion, uh, which is called Panthera atrox. When we compared this with fossils of American lion that we have in the ROM collections, it looks a lot like an American lion. And one of the hallmark features of the American lion is that it's really, really big. So American lions were gigantic cats. You can see me here uh, standing next to the silhouettes of a number of different fossil cat species. Um, this was taken at the uh, Natural History Museum in Los Angeles. Uh, and the American lion here is the uh, largest by all accounts. You can see I'm about five feet tall and the American lion was definitely bigger than I am. <laughs> Uh, and American lions have been found pretty much all over North America, including in Edmonton, Alberta. So this, this finding that we have of, um, of an American lion in Medicine Hat is, you know, is a reasonable expectation because we know we have American lions both south of here and north of here. So we felt pretty comfortable saying this is an American lion. Uh, we did hedge our bets a little bit and said that it is a, uh, a member of the genus Panthera that is similar just because there's not a lot of good descriptive work um, differentiating the toe bones of big panthers, um, which was understandable. So we wanted to make sure that, you know, we were clear that this is based off of the best available data, but that we could be proven wrong in the future. We also had some specimens that were sort of confounding. Um, this specimen was the one that gave me the most trouble and I was the most frustrated with, for sure. Uh, so this is an ulna that's a bone from the forearm. So it's the bone that actually forms the elbow joint. Um, and it was originally identified as a saber-toothed cat. Um, so as smiling off the talus, and that was, you know, that was really great. Um, that was what I wanted to find. Um, but when we looked at this a little bit further, compared it with the specimens of Smilodon that we have available at the ROM, we found that it didn't really look like Smilodon. It looked more like a pantherine cat, so something like a lion or a jaguar. Um, that said, it was too small to be an American lion. It was smaller than any of the American lion measurements we had on hand. And it was also too big to be a jaguar. So that's kind of puzzling. It's in this sort of no man's land of things that, you know, we thought were the most likely candidates for being in this area. But it, it turns out that there is another North American panther. So you can see here uh, in green, we have the range of Panthera leo, which is the lion that is alive today. In the blue, we have the range of Panthera atrox, um, which is the American lion. But then that big sort of orange splotch is Panthera spolea, or the cave lion. 
And the cave lion uh, has been found all across the continent of Eurasia, as well as in the part of North America that's known as Beringia. So Beringia includes the US state of Alaska, as well as the Yukon territory. So it's never before been identified from south of those areas, but it is, it is another sort of possible candidate for identification. And it turns out when we looked at uh, the measurements of cave lines from the Yukon, they were actually very, very close to the measurements that we had for this ulna. That said, the ulna that we have is missing the most diagnostic parts, so the parts that best tell us what it is, and those are um, the part that actually forms the elbow and the, the part that contacts with the wrist. Uh, so we didn't feel comfortable saying for certain that we have a cave lion. Um, so this is a very tentative assignment, but I, I can really hope, I really hope that we find more specimens to help us test this hypothesis, because if we have cave lion in medicine hat, uh, it tells us a really interesting story about, or at least adds to a really interesting story about the biogeography of North America during the last ice age. And the reason for this is that it suggests that there was maybe this mixing of northern and southern fauna. So northern fauna being the Beringian species that we see in Alaska and the Yukon, and southern fauna being the ones we see in the continental U.S. You know, we say we have a possible cave line from Medicine Hat, but then there's also this interesting study from 2013 when Julie Meachin and her colleagues suggested that the Beringian wolf, which is a particular sort of subgroup, it's called an ecomorph, um, of gray wolves seems to have migrated south to natural trap cave in Wyoming. And the proposed route that the Beringian wolf would have taken is through this ice-free corridor that would have existed between the two big ice sheets that existed during the last glaciation, the Cordilleran on the west and the Laurentide ice sheet towards the east. And if you follow this figure, all the little paw prints going down through the um, through this ice-free corridor, you'll see that it crosses paths with the southeastern corner of Alberta, right where Medicine Hat is. So if the cave lion were migrating south or sort of dipping its range down into this ice-free corridor, it makes sense that it could have made its way to Medicine Hat. Uh, but of course, we'll need more data to find this out. And then lastly, we had a really exciting find. Um, so this is the metacarpal that I showed you earlier, the one that I was holding in my hand. Uh, this one was originally identified as a saber cheese cat, so as Smilodon fatalis. And when we compared it with uh, a number of fossils from, from other species, it's a dead ringer for the Smilodon fatalis that we have from Peru at the ROM. So you can see here, uh, the figures A, B, C, D, and E are our specimen. F and G are Smilodon fatalis from Peru. And while our specimen, of course, is broken, it looks really, really similar to these other Smilodon specimens, which is really exciting. So we felt pretty confident that we could identify this as Smilodon fatalis, which means that, yeah, we did have Smilodon in Canada, which is really awesome. You can see um, this really lovely illustration depicting Smilodon in the snow in Medicine Hat. So what this does is this, this confirms that instead of having a Smilodon range that looks like this, where it was confined to sort of the United States, um, we have this sort of northward increase of about a thousand kilometers. And what's starting to take shape is that this range here looks sort of similar to what it would look like if you kind of you kind of superimpose the the two ice sheets there this really nicely matches up with the sort of border of those ice sheets which is really interesting another really interesting thing that we have going on in medicine hat is that we also probably had dire wolves so you can see here a picture of a den which is a lower jaw bone um, which was originally identified as a dire wolf. And like the Smilodon material, 
it hasn't been described in the literature, although it has been identified as a dire wolf. So we are looking to once again, sort of confirm this identification. You can see the specimen here. It's really beat up and it's from an old individual, which means that a lot of the features we would normally rely on to diagnose the specimen are either not present in the specimen or um, are gone because of tooth wear, because you know the animal was using its teeth so much that all of the points are gone. What we did is, um, well, I turned to my lab mate and colleague, Talia Loey mary who is really good with uh, techniques called geometric morphometrics. And I'm not gonna go into the details of this graph, um, but I just wanna point out that you've got in blue, your dire wolves. The two shades of orange are gray wolves, uh, the darker ones being ones uh, that are still alive today and the sort of light peachy colored dots being fossil gray wolves. And that big black star is our uh, mystery specimen from Medicine Hat. And what we find is that, especially on this second axis, so that vertical axis, it, it fits really nicely within the sort of shape space of dire wolves. And when we perform a statistical test to determine the probability that it is each of these different groups, it comes up with a probability of 0 0.74 that it's a dire wolf and much lower probabilities for the other group. So this suggests that this specimen is highly likely to be a dire wolf. Um, and this is research that we're currently working on publishing and hopefully will be out uh, by the end of this year. <laughs> So what this all is starting to tell us is that we had many more large carnivores in Alberta during the Pleistocene than we have today. And this is a common trend we see across much of North America. The other thing that we can say for sure is that it looks like the types of large carnivores that were present in the Medicine Hat area are very similar to the types that we find elsewhere in North America. So we have this sort of uh, typical Rancho Librean or typical Ice Age fauna. We have all of the large carnivores we'd expect and this sort of ecosystem that is typical of the age. But of course, uh, carnivores are only one piece of the puzzle here. So, you know, I just talked to you about only a small portion of this list. We have a ton of other species and of course we have a mix of both living and extinct species. So because we have these really great deposits that seem to cover the very end of the ice age and the extinction of all of these species that are no longer with us, we can start to take a look at how North America went from a continent with many large herbivores like horses and mammoths as well as the large predators that were hunting these large herbivores and then you know how did it go from that this sort of beautiful ecosystem with tons of large species to what we have today where we have far fewer big species in order to address these questions is to look at um, basically an analysis of funnel turnover. So what species are present when and where, and how does that change through time? So if we look at all of the Medicine Hat localities that have been collected and are um, all of the specimens that are stored at the Royal Ontario Museum, we find that horses are the most common specimens that, that we have. They make up about 44% of specimens. And then this is followed by camels, ground squirrels, mammoths, and bison. And then everything else that we have, each, uh, each, genus of, of or each genus of animal makes up less than 2% of specimens. So we've got this, this domination really by horses. Now, if we look at the proportion of families that are present in specific localities, um, you can see, uh, several different localities, six different localities here. I've decided to pull only the ones with more than 50 specimens that are that are held in our collections just because it makes it um, 
it gives us enough of a sample to really start to say something. Um, we see that this general trend where we have lots of horses, some camels, um, all that fun stuff, it, it generally holds up. So across all of these localities, somewhere between 43 to 69% of specimens are horse. So lots of horse. At four of these localities, uh, camel is the second most abundant taxon uh, with relative abundances between nine and 30%. At those other two localities, um, so at Mitchell Bluff, the ground squirrel called Spermophilus is the second most abundant genus. And this is really interesting because for most of the localities we have sampled, we don't have very many specimens from these small body taxa. Um, at most other localities, uh, they're either very rare or they're not present at all. And there's a few reasons why this may be. It could be because of differences in sampling effort where priority was given to collecting remains from large bodied animals. Um, or it could be that, you know, these were rare or didn't preserve in the deposits at these other localities. Now, what's interesting is that Mitchell Bluff is by far the most heavily sampled locality. So we have the most specimens from Mitchell Bluff. And this suggests that maybe if we we had sort of greater sampling effort from the other localities, maybe we would also find more small body tax of it. And then finally, at Lindo Bluff, bison is actually the second most abundant taxon with camel, which is the second most abundant in four of the other localities, is actually in third place. Now, at first glance, this suggests that maybe there is this one locality where bison were really common. But I think that there is a deeper message here, and I'll get to why that is in a few minutes. So what I've been doing is I've been looking at the proportion of different families of, of animal present by locality. But this poses a problem because most of the localities that have been collected from actually span multiple time periods. So Mitchell Bluff, which is on the far left there, is a really good example of this. We have a bunch of specimens from really old deposits, but there's also younger specimens mixed in there. So what this is saying is that we can't really look at the locality alone to get a picture of what's happening throughout the Ice Age and as, um, as we see these sort of global extinctions. Um, unfortunately, most of the specimens in our database don't have precise stratigraphic data. So while we might know that they come from Mitchell Bluff, we don't necessarily know if they come from the older part of Mitchell Bluff or the younger part of Mitchell Bluff. So we can't use locality alone. So this kind of poses a conundrum. Thankfully, 175 specimens do actually have associated stratigraphic and temporal data. So that's a much smaller sample size than our 1,200 specimens total, but it allows us to sort of start to do a preliminary look at um, the change in species over time. So this is very similar to the graphs that I was just showing, but this is the proportion of families present for each time bin. And what you see here is uh, younger time bins are towards the top and older time bins are towards the bottom. So if we look at this, we can start to see some really interesting trends. First, horses are actually staying relatively abundant throughout the entire Pleistocene and then into this post-glacial period where the Pleistocene is transitioning into the Holocene. So horses, of course, are now extinct um, and they did go extinct during this transition. But this is suggesting that they kind of hung on uh, maybe for a long time throughout that transition. Unfortunately, we don't know the exact timing of our post-glacial deposits. So we don't know at what point during this transition they actually fall. What I start to find really interesting is what we see when we start to look at some of the other taxa. So with camel, it's quite abundant through these older sections of strata. So it's, it's abundant through the Kansan, the Yarmuthian and the Sangamonian. But when we get into the last interglacial period, the Wisconsinan, 
there's a sharp decrease in the abundance of camels as represented in the fossils that we have. And then this is followed by a complete loss. Um, we don't have any camel specimens from deposits that were identified as post-glacial. Now, on the flip side to that, we have bison. And bison are relatively uncommon throughout most of the assemblages through which they're present. So they're uncommon throughout the sort of middle time period. And we actually don't have any bison from the oldest time period we have represented. But then when we get to the post-glacial period, bison explode in abundance. So this brings me back to Lindo Bluff, which is the site that I was saying has bison as the second most abundant taxon. And it turns out that if we look closer at the records for Lindo Bluff, uh, those deposits are prominently or predominantly post-glacial. And this suggestions that suggests that the abundance of bison at Lindo Bluff is due to the increase in abundance that follows the last glaciation. So to summarize this, let's look at what's happening or what appears to be happening to the fauna over time. So we see horses are abundant at all localities and remain relatively common throughout all of the time periods that are covered at Medicine Hat. Camels are also relatively abundant at most localities, but they seem to show a sharp decrease in abundance towards the end of the Pleistocene and they disappear completely during post-glacial sediments. Bison are relatively uncommon throughout the Pleistocene, but conversely, they become very abundant in our post-glacial deposits. And then lastly, we have some evidence that small mammals may be undersampled. We do find at Mitchell Bluff the most sort of rigorously sampled site. We see a lot of spermophilus, which is a, a genus of small mammals, but we don't see a lot at other sites. And that suggests that they might be being missed at the other sites. So of course, you know, the work is uh, never over with these sorts of things. So there's a number of next steps. So one of the things that I would like to do is to look at the original field during these collection periods uh, and actually see if we can find stratigraphic associations between particular specimens. I also wanna make sure that we are identifying more taxa to the species level. So everything that I presented to you today is looking at the genus level and what looking at the genus level neglects to neglects to identify as potential turnover between closely related species. So maybe at some point we see a shift between one species of horse to another species of horse. We don't have enough resolution at this time to say whether or not that happens. And then lastly, I hope to undertake new collection efforts uh, with a particular focus on getting the good stratigraphic control we need to answer these questions about the end of the ice age. Um, and also try to take a particular focus on looking for microfossils. So all of these small body taxa, because these small body taxa have a much, uh, they're much more sensitive to sort of minor environmental changes. And if we have them, we might be able to get more fine grained uh, interpretations of the changes that were happening. So I've started to dip my toes into that last little bit of, um, of trying to collect more fossils. In 2019, I took an excellent crew. Um, we were only out in Medicine Hat for five days, but we started to get our bearings and identify sites that would be good targets for um, work in future years. Um, and we were lucky enough to be filmed for the second season of Dino Trails, um, which you can watch on Amazon Prime or Amazon Video. Prime Video, is that what it's called? And yeah, I'm really excited to get back out there. Hopefully after, hopefully we'll all survive COVID and be able to go back out there soon. Um, so with that, uh, I wanna thank everybody for listening. I really look forward to answering your questions. And I also wanna thank all of my co-authors 
um, Rufus Tritcher and Archie Stalker, who collected the specimens that I've been working on, uh, funding the Royal Ontario Museum for giving me facilities, and of course, all of my friends and family. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ashley, for a great talk. It's uh, really exciting to see that Di Alberta is not only known for its rich fossil record uh, of dinosaurs, but also, yeah, there's an amazing fossil record for Ice Age mammals. So that's really interesting to see all the cool results that are coming out of, uh, of your research. So uh, I'll invite you all who, are, uh, listen, who have listened to Ashley's talk to type questions. You can write them down in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And um, before we move on to the, uh, the question period, I just want like to make an announcement for next week's talk on next Thursday. We'll have uh, Oksana Verigora from the University of Alberta. We'll talk about the fossil record and evolution of the modern herring. So if you like fish or you're a fisherman, then this talk is for you. So I invite you to come uh, next week to listen to Oksana's talk on the evolution of uh, the herring. So we received quite a few questions and more are coming in for you, Ashley. So if you're okay with that, I'll start going through some of the questions. Um, I have a first question from uh, Bill Bloss. He said, uh, can people speculate that saber-toothed cats went extinct because man overhunted their primary food sources and this is why they are no longer around? Do you have any thoughts on that uh, hypothesis? Yeah, um, it's a really good question. And uh, one of the sort of major areas of, of research in the Ice Age um, right now is what caused the extinction of all of these uh, large body of taxa. And it seems to depend from species to species. So for some species, it looks like um, the major factor in their extinction was the fact that climate was changing uh, towards the end of the Pleistocene. For others, they were heavily hunted by humans. And then for yet others, it was sort of a combination of these, these factors. And, um, and, you know, maybe they could have survived climate change, but they couldn't survive climate change plus hunting. Um, for Smilodon specifically, we we do know that it's, you know, it's likely that they went extinct because their primary prey went extinct. Uh, but we don't really know yet uh, which of those potential factors was the cause for their primary prey going extinct. It seems to vary um, across the things that they ate. Um, so I would say it's probably a, a combination of factors, but there's still more work to be done there. Cool, thank you. Uh, we have a few questions uh, about the growth rate based on the, some of the charts you presented at the start of your talk. Uh, we have a question from Dana. She, uh, they're asking, do you think the slow growth rate could be related to the cooler environment? If it is cool, more energy would be needed to keep the, keep the animal warm, so maybe less energy for growth? That's a really interesting question. Um, it would definitely be something that's worth exploring. Um, that said, mammals are a little bit more insulated, I guess, if you pardon the pun, from this sort of really strong effect of climate on their growth rates because mammals are warm-blooded um, and we produce our, our own heat. Um, so basically mammals tend to grow really fast regardless of whether they're in a hot or a cold environment. Um, that's not to say that there might there wouldn't be any minor effects, but I don't think that would be a major effect. Makes sense. Uh, another question again about growth rate from Joanna. How does growth rate correlate with adult body mass? It seems that the faster growth curve also belongs to the smaller of the big cats. So would a smaller big cat that isn't social have a faster growth curve than tigers? Is the growth rate correlated with social behavior or body mass or both? This is a really good question. Um, the answer is that it's probably correlated with both. Uh, the reason why my comparison that I showed you was with lions and tigers is, is partly because lions are social, but also because lions and tigers are the closest, closest in body mass to Smilodon. Um, and, you know, it's likely that something that 
grows bigger also has to grow fast in order to get that to that size. Um, so body mass does need to be taken into account depending on the question you're asking. Um, what's interesting is that, you know, from the perspective of extinction, it doesn't so much matter whether you grow fast or slow relative to your body size. It matters whether you grow just fast or slow. Um, and that's part of the reason why uh, large bodied species are at risk of extinction today because they tend to grow slower and therefore they tend to be more vulnerable to their populations being decimated and, and not being able to recover. Um, that said, uh, in the sort of final analyses for, um, for my PhD, we will be looking at sort of um, both growth rate in absolute terms, but also relative to body size. A uh, question from Darren. Uh, given the obvious importance of these localities and the man many still unanswered paleontological questions, are you or others planning on reopening these sites? Ah, um, yes. <laughs> um, I would very much like to. There are some... Um, there are some challenges to reopening the sites. Um, the site where both the Smilodon and our dire wolf come from uh, experienced a slump. It was a bluff um, overlooking the South Saskatchewan River and that bluff slumped in I think the 1980s. Um, so even if we have photographs of what the locality looked like in the past, it takes some some doing to try to relocate each um, each sort of layer in the rocks and things like that. Um, so yes, the goal is to relocate these localities as other as well as poke around to see if we can find new ones. Um, uh, we haven't had the time to to get to very many of them yet, uh, but we do think we've relocated the um, the surprise bluff locality, which is where the Smilodon came from. Cool. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, did the landscape, because I can't remember when you said Churcher had collected the material probably in the 60s. Has there been a lot of landscape yeah. change since then, like the slumpage that you mentioned, but also vegetation that has grown uh, on top of old outcrops? Uh, is that the, a problem in the area? Yeah. Um, yeah, there's definitely uh, that to be, I mean, for a lot of the localities too, they're now on private land. So um, we, we of course can't just go out there and and just like hop in and, and start tromping around. We have to make sure we get landowners uh, permission. So the truth is we haven't actually seen the, the state of many of the localities because we need to do that work of, of talking with the landowners in order to be able to revisit them. Yeah, it totally makes sense. I uh, have a question from uh, Jack. Could growth rate be related to diet, especially if you can ascertain a social or solitary lifestyle based on growth rate, uh, based on bone histology studies? Could the lifestyle of Smilodon indicate what kinds of herbivore it preyed upon? There has, I mean, I haven't seen, I haven't seen anything that would suggest that we could, um, we could determine the precise prey using bone histology. Um, but there are other really interesting avenues of research that can tell us more about the diet of these animals. And I'm thinking of uh, things like isotope analysis, um, which is where you look at the ratios of different isotopes of, of, of elements uh, within the bone or collagen of a fossil. And you can compare that with the isotope ratios of uh, the potential prey in the area and you can start to like draw connections between them. Uh, so that's not work that I am personally doing but a number of other researchers are and we've been getting interesting pictures about the diet of these predators that way. Cool, because yeah, I think most people picture Smilodon going after mammoths but I think previous studies have shown that horses and I think bisons may have been the primary prey for, for these predators. Yeah, um, with a lot of predators, it's um, like, was Smilodon capable of taking down young mammoths? Possibly. Um, but, you know, you see examples of lions taking down giraffes and elephants as well. Uh, 
but with lions their primary prey is not giraffes and elephants it's um it is things like uh, buffalo and zebras um so it's it's sort of likely that smilodon would have done something similar where it may have been capable of taking down these large prey items but it was primarily eating things that were a little bit smaller just because they're easier Oh, makes sense. Yeah. Easy, an easy snack is always better than yeah, big <laughs> beast mammoth. Uh, I have a question for Joanna again. I think it's about the histology when you show the growth rings. She's asking if you can tell how old these specimens are. And she's also asking, is it possible to use DNA to identify, maybe confirm the, the taxonomic identification of the fossils? Hmm. Um. So yes, we can tell how old they are based off of um, the histological thin sections we make. Um, so I've um, I've thin section specimens that range from two years old to about thirteen. I think is the oldest one that I've looked at so far, um, and that's really interesting because we can start to get a picture of you know, potentially how long they lived, although there's some some sort of wrinkles with that because you never know if they died from old age or due to other causes. Um, and then, sorry, remind me what the second part of the question was? Uh, if it's possible to use DNA to identify the, the fossils. Yeah, for many of the, the specimens that I work on, unfortunately, no. Um, Ancient DNA can be really finicky. Um, it, it's best found in certain body parts, um, which are not the same body parts as the ones that I'm looking at for my growth curves. Um, it's also really hard to recover ancient DNA from these um, tar pit localities because um, these tar pits are essentially these hydrocarbons uh, that can degrade soft tissue and can degrade DNA. Um, and it's actually, I mean, it's not DNA, but um, carbon dating relies on the collagen present in, in fossils. And it's difficult to do even carbon dating from these tar pit um, localities because you need to, there are special procedures essentially that you have to do in addition to the usual procedures in order to get the dates to actually work out. Cool. Uh, we have another question, a question from Nicholas. Is there any evidence of interaction between Smilodon and early human groups in the American fossil record? Yeah, there isn't any evidence of sort of direct relationship between Smilodon and humans in North America. Um, there's not been any, any bones found with cut marks or anything like that. That's not to say that they didn't interact. It's just that we don't have any direct evidence of it. That said, if we look at um, deposits in the old world, so in Africa and Eurasia, um, we do see more interactions between saber-toothed cats, not Smilodon, but other species of saber-toothed cats and human ancestors. Um, so in the cradle of humankind in Africa, there were saber-toothed cats present when humans were first evolving. Um, so it's definitely, they're definitely animals that we evolved to live with or live in the presence of. But no, there's no, no direct evidence of interaction in North America. Yeah, I think I can't remember if it's from the Yukon or uh, Alaska. I think there's cave paintings made by cave, well, uh, early man, the first arrivals in North America. And I think they have cave paintings of uh, Panthera spelia, a lion, yeah. but I don't think they have paintings of uh, Smilodon. So I'm not sure if this indicates that maybe they were so rare that they didn't really, although that was, that's much farther north from, uh, from Alberta. So maybe yeah, they had the scimitar tooth cats up there, but not Smilodon. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Um, it's, it's, it's been hard to find evidence of any sort of, um, ancient human art of saber tooth cats. There was, uh, for a while, there was a sculpture that it was hotly debated whether it was a sculpture of a lion or um, a scimitar tooth cat, a homotherium. And I think the consensus now is that it's a lion, um, but for a while it was thought that maybe it was. 
Um, yeah, I don't know why they the ancient people seem to uh, favor lions so much. <laughs> yeah, maybe it was bad uh, bad omen if you represented a <laughs> cat. Do you know where that sculpture is from, by any chance? Oh, I can't. Is it old world, or it's probably not. It's not... old world. Yeah, oh. I can't remember the the location off the top of my head, unfortunately. Okay. Cool. Uh, we have a question, a question from Chris Jazz from the RAM. How much time averaging is represented in the distribution map of a Smilodon that you showed? Uh, how old is the medicine hat record relative to those records from so the southern portions of the Smilodon distribution? Hi, Chris. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Um, you're you're being a reviewer here, aren't you? Um, <laughs> yeah. So there. The, the range map that I showed you is completely time averaged. Um, so that doesn't take into account um, the possibility that, you know, maybe it's it's a larger range increase if you, if you actually look at contemporaneous deposits. Um, part of the reason for that is just that it, uh, it honestly takes a lot of work to determine all of the, the provenance data for all of those localities. Um, it's something that I would love to do um, in the future to actually look at um, these temporal changes and where Smilodon was and, and all of that good stuff. Uh, it's unfortunately not something that I've been able to do yet. And then to talk a little bit about, um, sorry, now I forget the second part of the question again. <laughs> Uh, what was the age of the medicine hat localities mm. relative to those southern uh, occurrences? Yeah, so we we don't have direct dates for the Smilodon material. We do have dates for um, some pieces of wood that were found at the same locality, and I believe they're about 40, 45,000 years old, um, which is an expected age for a lot of those southern localities. Um, I don't know the ages of all of those localities, of course, off by heart, but um, it was during the same time period that Smilodon was found at the Liberia tar pits, for example. Cool. Uh, we have a question from Ian from the uh, Terrell Museum. I vaguely recall from a long time ago a documentary talking about pathological Smilodon specimens, a skull and a pelvis from Liberia, I think which had clearly sustained severe injury. It was posited that the injuries were so grievous that the animal must have been cared for by a social group in order to attain the degree of bone healing and remodeling observed. What are your thoughts on the sign of evidence for sociality? Um, yeah, so it, it has been pretty commonly argued that these instances of, of pathological bone suggest that there was some sort of group care and potential feeding of injured individuals. Um, the argument that has been made in the scientific literature is that um, living solitary cat species and other solitary carnivores can sustain really major injuries and still survive. Um, so it has been argued sort of both for and against these being uh, signs of social behavior. There are also other arguments for social behavior, like um, the fact that Smilodon is the second most common carnivore we find at Rancho La Brea, with the first being the dire wolf, which presumably lived in packs. Um, this shows sort of similarities to um, a phenomenon that's seen in the African savanna, where if you play distress calls of herbivores, um, the carnivorous species that tend to come and investigate those calls are, are a large proportion of them are social species. So that suggests that if, if carnivores are being drawn to these tar pits because of distress calls of mired animals, then you would expect that the social species would be the ones that are preserved and caught in higher proportions. Um, the truth is, is that this, the debate on whether Smilodon was social is still very much ongoing. Um, I, I do think the evidence suggests that they were likely social to some degree. Um, although the sort of next question is, was that social behavior sort of pride-like, 
which is how it's often depicted, or was it um, some other variation on social structure? Cool. Uh, we have a question from Craig Scott from also the Toronto Museum. Is there any indication of Bergman's rule in Smilodon where the body size of the animal would, cha would change with latitude? Hmm. Um, I haven't seen any studies that have actually looked at, at Bergman's rule um, across like geographical regions, there is some work that has looked at changes in body size within the Librea tar pits over time, um, which could be analogous to Bergman's rule because although latitude is not changing, the temperature or the ambient temperature would have changed. And there is some evidence that there is there are, are size changes that happened uh, in the Librea area throughout time. Um, which might suggest that you would see evidence of Bergman's rule if you actually looked at latitudinal gradients, um, but nobody has done that as of yet. Yeah, I don't think there's, uh, well, I mean, we know that, yes, Smilodon is widespread, but I, th and I think in terms of quality of fossil record, yeah, the Labrea tarpus is probably by far, yeah, the, the best ones to do a, a statistical analysis. The rest probably gonna be highly fragmentary fossils. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely at, at non-tar pit localities, uh, usually it's it's only fragmentary remains of Smilodon and other carnivores. Um, another thing that suggests that Bergman's rule may be at play is that the Smilodon from Talara uh, in Peru that we have at the Royal Ontario Museum uh, is on average smaller than the specimens from La Brea, which suggests that because they were at a lower latitude that, that there is possibly some latitudinal effect happening there. Oh, interesting. Uh, cool, we have a qu uh, question from Darren. I was surprised to see he's talking about the, the faunal list that you reported in the, some of your diagrams. I was surprised to see that turtles in the, uh, there were turtles in Medicine Hat during the Ice Age. Can you please elaborate on these finds? Are as cold-blooded creatures, what does their presence say about the paleoclimate in Medicine Hat during the late Pleistocene? Yeah, so um, I guess it's important to note that these deposits were formed during interglacial periods, so periods that that weren't quite as cold. Um, and I, to be honest, I haven't looked too much at the turtles, but my sort of first instinct is that we do see turtles in sort of temperate climates today where it can get quite cold in the winter. So it's possible that they were doing something similar there, um, basically uh, adopting similar behaviors to survive the winter. Um, and it's possible that during those actual glace, like glacial periods, they, they weren't present in the area. We'll never know because we don't have the deposits from those glacial times, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think we still have yeah, one endemic uh, turtle species in Alberta, and yeah, we're far from being a tropical paradise nowadays. Yeah. <laughs> a question from Brock. This is a random question, but are there any fossil evidences for the scimitar uh, cat homotherium known from in, in anywhere in southern Canada? Uh, it's not a random question, and actually, yes, there is. Um, there's a, a locality that's reasonably nearby to Medicine Hat called Wally's Beach. Um, where homotherium has um, been described. So it does seem that homotherium was also present in the sort of southern Alberta area. Um, and of course, homotherium is also found um, throughout the United States and um, in, in the Yukon and Alaska. Um, so if anything, homotherium may have actually been more uh, wide more widespread than Smilodon was, although it seems to be rarer in the southern parts of North America. Cool. Uh, we have a question from Robert. Do you think Smilodon would have switched between being social and solitary at different stages like lions and cheetahs? Would this affect your, their growth when they were social? They grow slowly and then when solitary, their growth would speed up. Does this apply to growth in lions and cheetahs? Hmm. That's a really interesting question. And yeah, there is a possibility that they were 
uh, you might say, facultatively social, where they didn't necessarily by default live in social groups, um, but they 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 could do so depending on the environment um, or their needs. Um, and yeah, cheetahs do something very similar. Uh, lions in, in sub-Saharan Africa, they may or may not form coalitions in which multiple males will take over a pride rather than just one. Um, and interestingly, in the Gur forests of India, the lions there don't do the pride-like behavior that we think of as typical for lions. They actually live in um, same sex groups. So there will be a group of females and groups of males and they only come together for mating. Um, I guess to answer your question, I don't have enough data yet to say whether there are differences in growth depending on, or that sort of relate to those, those differences in social behavior. It's something that I would like to investigate as part of my thesis. I just, I don't I don't have the data yet, unfortunately, to answer that. Yeah, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if an animal would be able, maybe within a species there could be variation, but if a, an animal switched lifestyle, yeah, I'm not sure if it would could impact. Yeah, that would be interesting to, to see if that happens. Um, a question from Sarah. Uh, is the order of extinction of these megafauna known specifically? Do we know if predators went extinct first or some prey went extinct first and that was kind of a consequence uh, for the extinction of carnivores after the fact. So in other words, did predators go extinct first or did the, the prey ex uh, went extinct first and do we know anything about which prey would have gone extinct first? Um, no, we don't really know. Um, in most of the, the places uh, where you can see sort of this extinction, taking place, we don't have the temporal resolution to be able to say the order in which things went extinct. Um, because it's likely that on a time scale um, of, you know, that we would expect for the geological record, it would happen very quickly. Um, so, you know, we, we kind of assume that it's likely that the prey went extinct first and that the lack of prey was why predators went extinct, um, but I don't know of any hard evidence that that actually details that uh, directly, um, at least for North America. Yeah, I think that's a subject yeah, of interest. Lots of people are looking at that and it's basically a matter of determining yeah, the, the age of all of these occurrences, try to determine which species went extinct with the first and yeah, the sequence of extinction, yeah, it's a really hot topic. So we have two last questions, if you're okay uh, with going uh, ahead with those. Yeah, uh, let's do it. A question from Nick, uh, great talk, Ashley. How much do you anticipate new specimen in Alberta helping resolve the presence uh, and the timing of the opening and closing of the ice-free corridor? especially pre-last glacial maximum. The global climate models simply assume no ice-free corridor until after the last glacial maximum. Uh, interested in hearing your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I think Alberta is exactly where you want to get more specimens to, to start to answer these questions. And we live in this sort of interesting world where um, because there's a lot more research money and a lot more institutions in the, U the United States, uh, there's a lot more effort that's undertaken, um, relatively speaking, um, down south. And uh, a lot of the, the work that is done up north is on dinosaurs, because, of course, Alberta has these amazing deposits of dinosaurs, you know, right in the Tyrell's backyard. Um, which is not to say we shouldn't look for dinosaurs, but, it, you know, there's definitely, there hasn't been, I think, as much work done on the ice age. And I do think that more work on these ice age deposits can help us answer these questions and, um, and will provide really interesting results. 
Yeah, I think on that subject, uh, I saw a talk maybe two weeks ago, ago by uh, Alvin Baudouin from the RAM, and yeah, she'd shown that yeah, it's based on Paul and then showing how obviously yeah, the opening of the ice record or uh, what was the timing and all that. So yeah, some of the answers yeah, are may not be in the vertebrate fossil record, but yeah. could be in the, the, the fossil pollen record that shows when plants were able to, to invade the areas and the, the timing. Uh, oh, there's one more question that came in as well. So I'll start with the one that I thought was gonna be the last. <laughs> a question from Darren. Uh, a 1969 Medicine Hat newspaper article mentions the discovery of a frog skeleton during the excavations. It was later re-identified as a toad. I made queries into the sign and no one seems to know anything about it. Do you know anything about the status of that specimen? I don't off the top of my head but Darren if you send me an email I will um try to look into it for you um I do know that some of the specimens that we have uh hadn't been cataloged because they hadn't been identified yet or we couldn't you know we had or we had trouble associating the tags with the specimens um so there's a there are a few boxes of specimens that have not yet been um, been entered into our database. And there's also some specimens that we recently found. Um, so yeah, it's possible that they've turned up since you last looked into it. Um, but yeah, let me know and I, I'd be happy to, to check it out. Cool, cool. Okay, now last question, I promise. This is the last one that's there uh, from Robert. Seeing that uh, by the Cenozoic, the continents were far apart uh, and close to their current position, how was it that lions went, lions went extinct in America, but made it to Africa and Asia? Hmm. Um, yeah, so I guess it's, it's not so much that they, they didn't come from North America and then go into Africa and Asia. Lions seem to have originated probably in Asia, although we're not totally sure there. And then actually from Asia, they would have dispersed sort of into Africa and into North America. Um, and it also does seem that the different species or the different types of lions, so the African lion, the cave lion, and the American lion are probably all different species. So they, they probably um, it, it does seem that the American lion and cave lion are closely related to each other, which makes sense because they're the closest geographically to one another. And the African lion is sort of the outgroup to those two species. Um, so the answer is that they all dispersed to where they were sort of before the Bering Land Bridge um, closed up. And of course now it doesn't exist. And then just some of the species went extinct while the African lion persisted. Cool, awesome. Well, I'm keeping my promise. This was the last <laughs> question. So thank you, Ashley, for taking so much of your time for answering all our questions and for giving a very interesting and enlightening uh, talk about yeah, the, the amazing fossil record from, uh, of the Ice Age from here in Alberta. So uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming and listening to the talks. Thank you for asking those questions. And Ashley, I got a special request that I'll forward to you directly by email from a group from the Medicine Hat area would be interested in uh, hearing more about your research there. So I'll forward you that, uh, that comment uh, by email. And then, uh, yeah, but otherwise, yeah. Thank you so much for giving a great talk. And then, uh, yeah, uh, hopefully yeah, we'll get to meet in, in person at some point in the not too distant future. And then, uh, yeah, also, I yeah, remember you saying that you're almost done with your PhD defending pretty soon. So good luck with the, the end of your research and where your defense, I'm sure you'll do great. And then uh, again, thank you for a great talk. Yeah, thank you for having me.